So having the hour of four o'clock um, been reached, we are gonna officially begin our meeting of the Cook County Commission on Social Innovation. This will be our March meeting. So super um, excited uh, to, to get us started. Um, so I just want um, the, the record to show that we have the following members present in our meeting. Uh, Chair Anaya, Vice Chair Lane, Commissioner Harry Alston, um, Commissioner uh, Christy De Laurentiis, Commissioner uh, Kristen Freeman, um, Alderperson um, Maria Haddon, and um, Commissioner Howard Mills. Um, I believe we are waiting for a few more folks that will be joining us in person, and we'll make sure to take note as, um, as they come in. Um, also present, I do want to acknowledge that I do have um, staff here, Thalia Valdivia staff. Um, staff is here. Um, Andrea Men uh, Meneses and Irene Lopez for the minutes. Um, we'll begin with public testimony. I'd like to ask uh, Thalia if you can please um, notify us if there have been any public testimony that has been um, asked. Just as a reminder for anybody listening to us, uh, public testimony or written comments um, need to be submitted 24 hours in advance of the meeting to 7th District. So that's the number seven, th, the word district, dot office at gmail.com. And we will uh, make sure to read any written comments or ensure that any of the public um, that needs to or wants to testify have the information necessary to be able to log into the meeting. Um, Thalia, do we have any public registered speakers or any written comments for the record? Uh, no, no, we do not. I've been informed that we do not have um, any um, public uh, written comments or requests to speak to the commission. Um, with that said, um, I will uh, make sure to, I'm going to turn it over to our vice chair, um, Elaine, to um, introduce to the uh, our, our wonderful uh, Professor Patton that will be speaking to us um, today and having the presentation. I believe most of the members have um, obtained the email that has the the um, the presentation, the deck, and um, we do have extra copies here um, for any of the members that join us in person. Um, so with that, I will uh, turn it over to uh, Vice Chair Lane. Uh, thank you, uh, Commissioner and I, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's a great pleasure to uh, introduce uh, Professor Desmond Upton Patton, who is a professor of social policy and psychiatry at the University of Pennsylvania. Extraordinarily distinguished career. He earned his MSW at the University of Michigan and his PhD here at the University of Chicago. Uh, he will be presenting on community-based data science approaches that can help prevent gun violence. Uh, so, uh, Professor Patton, thank you for joining us. And the floor is yours. We're eager to hear what you have to say. And, thank you. Uh, uh, Professor Patton, we're trying to get you the co-host um, um, so you're able to share the slides. So just bear with us for a second if you want to make any introductory comments. Sure. Th thank you so much for having me. I am sad that I'm not in Chicago. I uh, did my training in Chicago, which has informed the work that you're about to hear. Um, so I have great affinity for the city um, and I'm excited to uh, speak with you all in just a few moments. Um, I guess just let me know when I'm ready to share screen. Um, I thought I had full host abilities and it, it wasn't letting me, but um, it looks like you, you are a co-host now. Wonderful. Let me get started here. To share your screen. Okay, let's see here. Okay. Send me the presentation. All right. Yes. No, one more second. Okay. Can everyone see those slides? We can. Okay, yeah. wonderful. Thank yes. you so much. So again, thank you so much for having me this afternoon. Uh, today, I want to focus on the broader impact social media has had on gun violence prevention and how I use artificial intelligence, social work thinking, and qualitative methods to do this work. Uh, for almost a decade, I have understood 
uh, it's study social media as a neighborhood, as an environmental context where youth spend an enormous amount of time building community, exchanging ideas, developing and running social movements, and on the other hand, engage in exposed to trauma, harm, grief, and violence in, expressed in text, video, images, live stream, and the like. Critical to this journey has been an intentional transdisciplinary approach and integration of ideas and theories and methods in order to define and analyze and widely disseminate these findings and challenges surrounding and the challenges surrounding this new area of study. My work is powered by the SAFE Lab, for which I am the founding director. Uh, the lab is focused on examining the ways in which youth of color navigate violence on and offline. We draw on computational and social work approaches to research and communication theories. And we engage in qualitative methods and natural language processing methods to understand the mechanisms of violence and how to prevent and intervene in violence that occurs in neighborhoods and social media environments. So the problem of social media as a trigger or amplifier of gun violence is not just a story about how users engage social media platforms. It must also contend with how platforms are designed, how artificial intelligence and other emerging tech tools are deployed to control what you see and the community guidelines that are developed to mitigate harm for some. The problem of social media and gun violence is a transdisciplinary issue that requires an integration not only of methods and theories, but also reimagining who is at the table, what true community collaboration looks like, centering marginalized voices, ideas, beliefs that go beyond checking boxes and just window dressing. So it requires a 21st century research infrastructure that, is, that can support inclusive and equitable um, dissemination of findings as well. And as a social worker, I believe that social work should be at the front of technology design, development, and the deployment of artificial intelligence for this problem of gun violence. And so in my work, I posit the idea of social work thinking as an apparatus of social change within the context of artificial intelligent design. Social work thinking leverages the National Association of Social Work Code of Ethics, ideas like honoring the dignity and worth of every person, centering the importance of human relationships and engaging in trustworthy practices that anchor how social work thinking can be applied for AI design for gun violence prevention. And so the motivations for this work are twofold for me. One is which I'm sure everyone here is very well aware, gun violence is an epidemic in the United States and has always been particularly acute in cities like Chicago. And at the time of my earliest studies uh, of gun violence in Chicago, the city was experiencing a 58% increase in homicides. And at the same time, youth are using social media at an enormous rate. And at the time of my earlier studies, Twitter was a prevalent site for Black youth. This has shifted over the last decade or so to, towards Instagram and TikTok. Uh, but Twitter has become a foundational platform for the study of gun violence. And what we also know is that youth have fully embraced social media and oftentimes the family experts on how to use these platforms that are available to us. Youth stated motivations for using social media uh, are quite similar to traditional forms of communication. They wanna stay in touch with friends, make plans to get to know people better, present oneself, share music, talk about relationships, laugh, have joy, experience all the positivity that we have in our world. But the data from Pew suggests that 90%, 92% of young people spend an enormous amount of time online that 71% of users have more than one social media site. And of those teens, 45% of black teens um, were using Twitter. So the question that has been situated in my program of research is, what is the role of technology and in particular social media in the transmission of violence? So what we've seen over the last decade or so is a merger of complex beefs and taunts 
within and between crews and cliques that are expressed in short, pivy posts and images that lack context, nuance, or any broader explanation. What we see now is what Jeffrey Lane from Rutgers University calls the digital street, or what Robin Stevens is now referring to as the digital neighborhood. The digital street is subtly different from the physical street in that it alters how people connect and it restructures daily life by shaping identities, decisions, and behaviors of youth and thus potentially impacting exposure to harm or increased risk for injury. And so it is, I'm going to take you through a journey in my career. Um, I study at the University of Chicago and was studying high achieving Black boys uh, on the northwest side of the city who were living in one of the most violent neighborhoods in Chicago, but also had 4.0 GPAs. And one of the things that kept coming up in my interviews with these young people were their ability to navigate safety using social media and that they had this ability to cognitively geocode safe and unsafe locations by how people describe activities and engagements and how they converse with each other on Twitter. So I became really fascinated with this particular um, strategy. And then a couple of months later, there was a uh, national story about two well-known rappers from the South Side, uh, Chief Keith and Little Jojo. One was in Black Disciples, the other one was in Gangster Disciples. And they were beefing on Twitter and Little Jojo became fed up with the back and forth on Twitter and he posted his exact location on Twitter and with three hours he was murdered in that exact location. So based on what I heard from young people and what I saw in national news between these two rappers, I became really interested in understanding the impact and role that social media was having in this acceleration of violence and this ability to navigate violence. And so I went to the literature like any junior professor would do and there was no literature on this topic. And so with my classmates from the University of Chicago, we wrote one of the first papers to coin this term internet banging or cyber banging, which is really just a play on words. And what we wanted to do was put some parameters and some definitions on what we were seeing online. And so we interrogated the computer mediated communications literature, looked at dozens of YouTube videos, and really began to understand the role of how masculinity and how present presentation on social media shows up and affects communication, how the role of hip hop and drill music may be layered into how people are communicating and sharing ideas, sharing threats online, and the necessary need to focus on language and the complexity of language and understanding and making meaning of what's happening online. So after we wrote that paper, we then wanted to engage in empirical work. And what I quickly knew is that in order to do this well, I needed to have a trusted, trusted community partner and I needed to have better relationships with young people. And so luckily I was able to, uh, to connect with Eddie Boca Negro, which I'm sure many of you probably know um, in the city, who at the time was the co-executive director of the violence prevention program at the YMCA. And what I remember mostly about our first encounter is that he basically entered me interviewed me for two hours. I was sitting in the parking lot at, at Leona's and he interviewed me for two hours to make sure that I wasn't going to harm young people, that I wasn't going to be invasive and that my goals and aims were in line with how he saw um, how research sh should be conducted within a community setting. And so I, I, I guess I um, um, had the right answers and then he allowed me to work with his young people. He um, helped me to identify um, up to 40 black and brown young boys and men in Chicago to spend time with to understand um, how social media was affecting their life and how they navigate violence. And we also had an opportunity to speak with violence outreach workers, around 20 individuals uh, who were working to affect change uh, across neighborhoods in the city. And so Eddie and I partnered up to conduct the first internet banking qualitative study. This was a study that was sponsored by the University of Michigan where I was um, an assistant professor from 2012 to 2015. And we conducted around 34 semi-structured interviews with, um, with black boys and men, around 17 outreach workers. And our central research question is, what's the role of social media playing in gang violence? And so one of the key learnings that we 
had was around what violence outreach workers already knew about social media and what they saw as needs and opportunities for how we might use social media as an intervention and prevention tool. And so I wanted to share a narrative from one of those outreach workers that really puts a fine point on what and, and how they understand the impact of social media. And so one of the outreachers says to me in an interview, so when somebody dies, it, had, it hasn't happened since leadership found out, but when guys would die, they would make a Facebook page, such and such Rock's page, instead of being like Jose Gar Garcia's page. It was, for instance, Speedy Rock's, and then it would be a picture of him, and then, you know, they would draw disrespectful symbols like penises around his mouth and bloodstains all over, and this would fuel more stuff, right? And so the disrespect, the commenting, the posting that is placed on Facebook or any other platform became a triggering effect for how a conversation or an argument would move from social media to offline. My life would forever change, however, when I encountered the story and narrative of a daughter of Chicago, uh, Ja'Kyra Barnes. Uh, we have focused on Ja'Kyra Barnes since her death in April of 2014. Ja'Kyra was exposed to violence at a very young age and had recurring experiences with death, death and loss, probably more than most of us would ever experience in a lifetime. Just weeks after her first birthday, her father was shot and killed. As she entered her formative teenage years, she joined a gang in the Woodlawn neighborhood of Chicago. The death that seemed to impact Ja'Kyra the most was that of her friend Taekwon Tyler. And at 13 years old, this young boy was murdered in their neighborhood. And then she then adopted the Twitter handle at Taekwon Assassin in reference to him. Uh, but before Ja'Kyra's own brutal untimely death in April, on April 11, 2014, her friend Little B was shot and killed allegedly by the Chicago police. Now, what made Ja'Kyra's story most unique is that a couple of things. Number one, uh, it's not uncommon for young girls to be in gangs. It was uncommon for a young girl to be deemed the shooter or hitter of a gang. And so Ja'Kyra had that title within her gang, the Flyboy Gang on the South Side. She also uh, used social media to, com to communicate every element of her daily life, from joys and happiness to new relationships, to fear, to pain, and also threatening and taunting rival crews and cliques. And so Ja'Kyra had this mythology on Twitter that superseded her. She also was a frequent Twitter user. She had around 5,000 followers and around 20,000 plus posts, which at that time placed her in the 95th percentile of Twitter users. But I think this is where things get complicated for me as a researcher, and, and I wanted to present this as a cautionary tale. So as a Black scholar, I had been imbibing uh, narratives white toxic and white supremacist narratives about young black children, in particular young black girls that affected how I saw Ja'Kyra, how I understood her and how I would analyze her tweets. And so one of the biggest news heading was from the Chicago Sun-Times that called her the gun-toting gang girl of Chicago. And never once where there's, a, where there's a conversation or an excerpt or a narrative that, that really showed the fullness of who Ja'Kyra was. And there's an early researcher, I wasn't looking for it. And so I missed it. And so instead of looking for tweets for posts that would show me Ja'Kyra, I looked for posts that proved that Ja'Kyra was bad, that she was a murderer, and that she was that gun-toting Black girl. And so I found them. Posts like, Vernon, that's the gun line. You cross it, you end, up, you end up on the headlines. This is, you know, has the rhythm of a drill music lyric but also is an invisible boundary that's important to understand when thinking about gang violence prevention. Anyone can get these hands in this life. We see the ops fuck them, we're gonna smoke them. These are the kind of posts that were readily apparent because those are the kind of posts that I was looking for. I had been trained and, fr and framed Ja'Kyra within a particular narrative. But what this young black girl did for me in death was that she forced me to reckon with her humanity. She forced me to see her as a full person as a full human being who feels and loves just like all of us. And so when she did that, and I kept combing through and going through more data, 
I saw grief, I saw pain. On 4 and the ops kill my bro bro, broken heart. The one line that continues to haunt me is my struggle ain't never been told, right? How many times have a, have a young person tried to communicate to us about the hardships of life, but it's never understood or communicated to its fullest extent? But as you might imagine, as you look at some of these lyrics, you might be asking yourself, I don't know what this young person is saying. I don't know what these words mean. I don't know what these emojis mean. Like, how do you make sense of this? How do you decode this? Well, I had the exact same reaction. It was a big embarrassing moment for me as someone that was hanging out in Chicago, thought they were hip, thought they understood what young people were saying online. I absolutely did not. But it was also a humbling moment to understand where my expertise ended and where their expertise began. And so a part of what we needed to do was create a methodology for centering interpretation and context and nuance and centering the voices of young Black folks so that we can get to, to meaning to be able to actually do something with this data. And so we created the contextual analysis of social media approach. Uh, and we call it CHASM. And through CHASM, we provide a methodological process to contextually um, look for the main specific labels on social media for the training of artificial intelligence or algorithmic systems. CASM approach serves as a method to bridge the identified gaps between inadequacies in current language processing tools and differences in geographic, cultural, and age-related variants of social media. And this is a team-based approach in which we hire young people as the main experts. We pay them like we would pay a uh, graduate student. So we hired young people from the South Side, from, from Jakaira's neighborhood to be consultants, to be research assistants, to help us to understand the language. Because oftentimes, usually the language is so hyper-local that if you're not from that block, from that neighborhood, you will miss it. No matter where you're from, if you don't understand what that street means in the context of the neighborhood, you might miss the intended meaning. And so in this particular post, Jay Smoker thinking about deep money, it became really helpful to speak with young people to understand that this particular post is talking about grief. Someone has died, but also there, someone is being disrespected. So the use of weed in naming that weed is a way of disrespecting someone that has been murdered, right? And so this post is telling us that there are at least three different things that are happening. Someone is grieving, someone's being disrespected, and that they are smoking a substance in order to process or to make fun of this death as well. Again, as I said, critical to this process has been working with young people. And so one of the things that has been critically important to this work, we cannot do this work without partnering with community-based organizations and folks like Eddie Boca Negro in order to find domain experts. But we also needed to find mentors to support us along the journey. Well, another kind of eye-opening learning point for me was to understand that I may have this goal of bringing on young people and paying them well, but our goals may not be lined up. And these are a number of the young people who had life happen and they couldn't always work with us in the way that we hoped to. But once we introduced mentors into our research process to support the young people when things would happen, our relationship and our communication and hopefully their development and training increased over time. And so we hired young people and then we also wanted to develop a system to capture this data and to then be in a natural setting where we can analyze and interpret social media posts and to really wrestle with context and meaning and to really put our biases on the table. One of the assumptions that we make as a lab is that we all have bias, regardless of social economic class and race and gender, and that we need to put those biases on the table and wrestle with them and interrogate them as we're looking at social media posts. And so we created VATOS, which is an annotation system or a labeling system where we take social media data, plop it into the system, and then work with our domain experts and also master of social work students um, who are training in social work to look at data as well. So I'm going to run you through a quick demo of how this works. We're going to work with this post. I've been up for like three days straight. So one of our annotators, this is an MSW student. This person has some experience with youth. Uh, they've worked in big cities. They've worked in violence prevention. So you have a context for who they are. 
And so we first want to get a baseline interpretation. What do you think is happening in a social media post with no context? And so they go look at the post. I've been up for three days straight. And the annotator says he hasn't slept in days. Not helpful, not a lot of context, doesn't get us anywhere. But chasm, our process that I told you that we needed to develop, asked the annotator to go through at least seven mechanisms for looking at context. Go back to your original social media post, utilize web-based resources, go back to the post, uh, the author of the post, look at the peer network someone may, may claim to be gang involved but be following Disney characters, so trying to understand the discontinuity there. Looking at offline events and how events that happen in the neighborhood, in the city, in the, in the country affect how people talk about those things online. Looking at the virality of a post and who's engaging with that post. So we asked the annotators to go through all of those layers of context and then go back to that post. Well, now they have a lot more to say. This user is saying that he's been up for like three days straight, most likely meaning he hasn't slept in three days. This post comes days after his friend was killed. This user may be having difficulty sleeping because of his friend's death. So now we know that someone may have been killed and that it humanizes why this person isn't sleeping. So now the sleeping isn't just a thing that's happening nowhere. Now we have some context for understanding why this person may be having trouble sleeping and why this person may be articulating this type of experience on social media. So this is the kind of contextual activities that we engage in to then label data. So in partnership with computer scientists, we wanna create a set of labels on social media posts that can then go to train an algorithm to automatically find those posts without the human human's involvement. So we're training the algorithm to think like us contextually so we can automatically find it without our help. The hardest part of being a social worker partnering with computer scientists is this need to put everything in these neat binary classifications. And so we did it, but with lots of struggle. So our two labels that are found most predominantly in the data were grief and aggression. And then everything else, all the other really important things were grouped as other. So these are the labels that have been handed off to our computer science colleagues for analysis. But before we hand those labels off, we go back to those young people, again, understanding where our expertise ends and where theirs begin. And we wanna see, do you agree with our labels? Do you agree with how we're seeing the world? Are we missing anything? And then we study those disagreements because there was oftentimes a disagreement in how we were labeling something because the young people would have backstories. They would get place and context. They would perhaps know someone in that post or get, hand gestures and clothing, and all those things as well. And so we really wanted to, to make sure that we check back in with those young people, valuing their expertise before we apply a final label. And we would take their understanding of a label over our own. So we wanted to test this, right? We wanted to see, does this work? Does having human intelligence and context make for a better algorithm? And what we learn is that when we have humans in the loop, when we have human intelligence at play, our algorithm is able to find those labels of aggression and grief correctly in the social media data set correctly 64% of the time. That's your macro F1. So human intelligence does help improve accuracy. Now, is this accurate? We're far from 100 still. But when the data is unlabeled without human intelligence, the 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 algorithm's ability to find those concepts in the social media data can only find it correctly 52% of the time. And so context matters. Accuracy is still on the table. And one of the questions that we are constantly asking ourselves as a practice of reflexivity is what does it mean to be accurate in this context of gun violence? What does it mean to have an, a, an, an algorithmic system that can accurately interpret African-American English and the experiences of Black youth. Is that helpful or harmful? And that's the question that we're constantly wrestling with and I don't have a full answer to yet and would love to get your thoughts and feedback around that. But it raises questions and it raises ethical questions. So this is why having these types of processes has been really important in our work. And so again, we're handing this off to our data science colleagues. These are my, my, my friends from Columbia. I just left Columbia to join the faculty at Penn just last past year. It's Kathy McEwen, expert in tech summarization. Um, and, and the Dean of the Engineering School, Ashifu Chang, who was an expert in computer vision. And we have been working together for the last seven years. 
And so in this work using artificial intelligence, we want to predict labels of aggression, loss, and other. We want to use as much unlabeled data as possible, and we want to use context. And so in our initial experiment, we first, this has never been done before. So when we started, this, this type of work had never been done before. So what we wanted to do was start small. So this isn't a big data approach. This is a thick data approach. Let's use a small amount of data and see if these algorithmic tools are helpful or not. So we start off with about 800, tweet, 800 tweets. And we want to see if, um, uh, if these algorithmic systems can correctly predict these labels. And what we learned in this process and you can find more uh, about this in this paper, Automatically Processing Tweets, is that, number one, the algorithms consistently failed. They could not understand African-American English. They could not grapple with context. One of the awkward and most, most weird conversations I ever had to have was explaining to my computer science colleagues around the use of the N-word, because the systems kept identifying the N-word as being an aggressive term. So I had to have the uncomfortable conversation around the use of the N-word is not necessarily a negative term within the Black community. And so, but that type of translation work was critically important for the algorithm because think about it in a different context. Think about how that may show up within a policing context, a law enforcement context, right? Which would not have that layered and contextual opportunity. And so this becomes a feature of how we process and do our work together. Then experiment two, add more data, right? Get more data, more unlabeled data. And then let's also look more extensively within Jakaira's network. So we start with Jakaira, we then look at her friends, the people that she has the most mentions and replies with, and we pull their Twitter data as well, which then um, allows us to get almost 300 users and around a million posts, right? What we learned is that when we integrate more context and have more data and use more humans in the loop, our accuracy increases. And so in that first experiment, we were hitting at around 62% accuracy. When we added more data and more context, uh, we get closer to 70%. Again, but always thinking about, wow, what does it mean to get closer to 100? Is this good? Is this harmful? Is this helpful? Is this bad? Don't know. And then we wanted to add in images. And so we gathered around 2,000 tweets within that larger data set that were connected to Jakaira and her friends that also had an accompanying image with it as well. And we wanted to see, um, does having an image help us to be more accurate? Here, here are some examples of the types of things that we would readily see in the data set. These are not from the data set. These are Google stock images. We don't want to bring in the images from the social media data for ethical purposes. But here's the type of thing that we were um, able to predict. And what we learned is that computer vision was really good at helping us to identify aggressive labels because things like a gun could be um, it's, it's easier for the algorithm to pick up. But then it's also thinking or considering the context around the gun, who's holding the gun and how you're holding the gun. All those particular layers are important to be disaggregated from, this, from the use of the algorithm. We also learned that um, using both text or NLP and computer vision was better at identifying grief because of the words that are used and that um, um, both were equally as helpful for identifying substance use as well. So many of you might be sitting around thinking like, is this ethical? Is this big brother? Like, what are you doing? Is this surveillance? Is this, you know, what are we doing here? Are we targeting black kids? Is this actually helpful? And so this work really sits within these two really important ethical um, considerations. Number one, we spent a lot of time talking to Black families and Black parents in Chicago, where we heard over and over and over again is that Black families want their kids to be safe and desire any tool possible that would help achieve these ends. And then as a social work scientist and a, and a social scientist, you also know that digital surveillance and policing enacts and enhances yet another form of state violence on Black people and communities of color, right? And so needing to constantly be toggling between these two ethical issues. And so one of the things that, you know, I think we need to, to consider in terms of our methodology and our practices, especially with using CASM, is to understand the social context in which we're applying these tools, questioning how we identify and determine what success means, and if extraction of context when using NLP is actually going to be helpful in our analysis process and is going to help us validate our findings. What's the goal? Why are we doing this? How are we doing this? What's the purpose? We've always wanted to develop platforms with communities in Chicago for real-time social media updates. And so you're a violence interruption person. You are working in on, you know, working in Woodlawn. 
And there's an argument that's happening on TikTok. You don't know that argument, the argument's happening on TikTok because you're not on TikTok yet, or you can't manage the millions of posts that are coming through TikTok, but you know the neighborhood, you know the community, you know the folks in the neighborhood. What if we can mitigate the gap by providing you with um, real-time updates of language that may be bubbling up, not individuals, but labeling and precise locations of where content uh, might be bubbling up so that you have that additional data point when, how, when deciding how you're gonna intervene, when you're gonna intervene, so forth and so on. But it's not that easy. <laughs> we keep running into roadblocks, right? One of the issues that I deal with in some of my uh, theoretical work is that I'm developing a conceptual framework to theorize how in an era of big data and criminal justice practice, social media policing may adversely affect communities of color. For example, I critique how race affects social media policing through the juxtaposition of social media use during the 2014 arrest of Black youth in New York City on the left who were hyper surveilled for months and were captured and interviewed and arrested before they even committed a crime because they were in the same Facebook pictures with folks who may have been associated with gang or may have been associated with criminal activity versus and compared to the social media monitoring in the case of Dylan Ruff, the, 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 the murderer of the Charleston church shooting in 2013 that killed nine black people um, in South Carolina and the other individual who, who, who um, was a part of the shooting in Pittsburgh, they had these racist manifestos that were posted on social media platforms, but we didn't find those racist manifestos until after the fact, right? So the disparate use of surveillance and strategy is a part of the problem. Hence why we need to take a, we had, we had to take a moment and pause before deploying these tools because we need to make sure that we have the right ethical guidelines and frameworks in place. And we need to consider what our non-negotiables are in, in, in this product design and, and how we develop these types of products. So I just wanna leave you with a couple of things that I, that I hope we can kind of think with think about, number one, I, I think social media should be understood as a community. It's a neighborhood. It's not this thing over here. It is life. And there's a place where people live that isn't necessarily distinct from the offline world. I know there's a lot of talk about performance, but I think we might also consider performance as an aspirational self. So what, what, how might we think about those performative elements as an artifact or a piece of, of, of who we want to be or how we show up in the world? I think social media can be a powerful tool for understanding and preventing root causes of violence. I think AI offers an opportunity to augment and to bolster violence prevention. And I think it's most useful in understanding root causes of violence. I do not think that AI should be used to predict violence. I do not think that AI should be used to surveil black communities. I think it can help us to understand what people are talking about, how they're affected, uh, who they're associated with in ways that can help us to, to, to hopefully develop better questions of how we may analyze and identify problems. I think, however, social media and AI are not the sole answers to violence prevention and when not used thoughtfully and correctly can be a tool for surveillance and mass incarceration. I think it's important to always be working to uncover and recognizing personal institutional bias in this application of AI for gun violence prevention and to consider its utility. But this work should never be done alone. It, it's hyper important to do this, to have critical and diverse perspectives and voices when we're considering if and how we might use data science for gun violence prevention. I'm gonna quickly run through a couple of other things that may give you some new insights of how this work has been, how we've shifted in our work based on what we've learned from Jakaira and some of the mistakes that we've made. Uh, we have partnered with the city of New York, uh, with the um, New York City's mayor's office to use this as a well-being application. And what this allows us to do is to compare what we learn on social media to qualitative interviews and to understand the linkages between things like housing and violence, right? Um, and so this has become a, an important way of using social media to validate the things that we see in the neighborhood through interviews and survey-based work as well. What we've learned from young people is that joy cannot be left out of this equation and that many young people were already using joy as an intervention for well-being and for living in a thriving world, but also as a way to quell a particularly aggressive moment that may be perpetrating on a social media platform. So now with a gift from Microsoft, we are not gonna be studying joy. We have uh, a youth advisory council with young people from Philly and New York to first 
uh, define joy, to understand concepts of joy, and then to use artificial intelligence to find these concepts across social media platforms. Um, and then we want to help people connect around joy as a way of intervening in violence that may be happening across communities. And then we also just want to be talking to folks that might be using social media as a tool for violence prevention. And so we created this um, uh, platform uh, called IESO that helps us to understand and to identify signs of digital stress online as well. Um, and so this is an ongoing um, um, study in New York City. We're in year two of this process. Um, I'm writing a book about Shakira and about Chicago and digital loss, and I had an opportunity to spend some time with Jakaira's mom and just learn a lot about her. One of the things that was really important for me in this work is to get her approval for studying Jakaira, and she was really helpful and also gave me her approval uh, to do this work. And one of the things that she said with me that, has, that sticks with me is this is quote, um, I was hurt and in pain. Uh, I was a million things, but I was numb to the fact because this happened so many times previously. So think about the histories of violence in Chicago. What do I do now? What do I do? Do I do what other parents do? They don't want to talk about it. We're just waiting on the next kid to die. I never got a chance to really grieve because I had to jump back into life going on. I just vowed to her on her deathbed. I wouldn't let her name go in vain. So as a mother, as a young black female from the same streets of Chicago where my daughter was killed, I know what she went through. And so this, I hope that this book um, helps to further uh, Chantel Brown's work and her mission to keep her daughter's name alive. Thank you so much. So, Dr. Panther, thank you very much and very enlightening presentation. Uh, we'll invite questions or comments from the commissioners. Uh, I'm not seeing any here uh, online, anyone's hand up. Um, I do see Commissioner Austin. Yeah, Commissioner Austin, I, I was hoping you would weigh in on this, and I'm eager to hear your question or line of inquiry. Well, first of all, thank everyone for joining us today, and thank you, Dr. Patton, for accepting my invitation to begin this conversation. I appreciate that. Uh, I wanted to go back to something you and I had talked about, and you spoke about it perhaps a little more sophisticated today, and, and that is the concept of social media as community and also the focus on achieving community health and well-being as opposed to trying to predict violence and, and bad actors. So you talked a little bit about that at the, at the end of your presentation. I would like to hear uh, some more of your thoughts as we begin to look at this work and think about some of the, the root causes, but also at the same time, trying to find some more immediate solutions that we can uh, raise up to the county for consideration. So whatever reaction you might have to that question, I'm, I open the floor, not only to you, but others, others here. I think my, my research and my outlook in this space fundamentally changed when I saw social media as a neighborhood. And what that meant for me is that I now saw folks as embedded in a world that is full of the complexities and opportunities that we have in the physical world. And that we can look towards the features of speech and language and image and video as clues, as context, as understanding for understanding what people are going through and it gives you a really diverse view of the connections between economics and school and health and mental health in ways that are really hard to get at in surveys and traditional research methodologies. And so what I've appreciated is that it allows me to see an individual nested within a network, nested within a city, nested within a neighborhood and then to see how that relationship unfolds within and between other people, to see to see how dynamics unfold, but to also see how people love and like and live. And I think that all of those elements are just really important to think of, thinking about the health, not just of the physical community, but understanding that the health of the physical community is directly tied to the health of a digital community. Now, that's not necessarily the, 
your sole responsibility because they are platforms that also need to be held accountable in their space. But I think it's an important connection that needs to be made. Commissioner Mills? Is that for me? I... Yes. Thank you so much, Commissioner. Um, Dr. Patton, very grateful for this presentation. It's extremely uh, rich, and I wanted to ask a couple questions about your research, your, the team, and, and how you gain access to some of these data points. The most specific question I had is, it's very language-based, and I wonder about TikTok, because, uh, not because I'm a Hyundai owner, but when I saw the Hyundai TikTok, my reaction was to notify Hyundai that they may have a problem on their hands. Others saw a video and interpreted what that video could teach. And it isn't good. <laughs> and for those are, are my fellow commissioners, it's how to steal a Hyundai that uses a steel key, okay? And it's not that difficult to do, but you're looking at a possible predictor in that instance of, uh, there is some audio, but there's also this visual context that's going on. And I'm wondering, um, I, I think I saw on your LinkedIn that you consult to TikTok. Is that is that correct? That's correct. And is there been any kind of reaction on behalf of your team to begin looking at some things that are not necessarily all verbal and not confusing the AI as much, but rather... In fact, researchers that came out of, of uh, University of Pennsylvania, one who teaches at the University of Chicago now, Susan Golden Meadow, her whole research is on nonverbal communication and what what signs mean, okay, both in the, the hearing and the non-hearing world. So my question is, what's going on first with respect to the um, non uh you know, the the not written word, but rather the the kind of visual symbols? Yeah, so we we have we have deployed computer vision techniques in our own work. We haven't done it with TikTok, uh, but it has been useful to do a couple of things. Number one, again, reaching back out to those domain experts to draw bounding boxes around images so that we can then have conversations around how we might process and contextualize those images and videos. Again, these are tools that can be used across systems and communities at any point. The challenge is the interpretive lens, right? So one could see a video around someone stealing a Hyundai, and if they see a white boy doing that, a white child doing that, that image in that experience could be interpreted one way. But if that individual were a young black girl or black boy, that image could be interpreted very differently. And it also has impact on how things are reported on social media platforms as well. These reporting mechanisms are, the evidence around them is not super helpful. We don't know if they're actually helpful features or not, but we do know that when that experience is racialized and the, the reporting ticks up, we get more reporting when there's some type of feature that just suggests that that person is of a different race. And so, um, I think there, I think we need to, we need more research in this space. Um, TikTok is very much concerned about the, we, we are having conversations about these issues. It is so, certainly at the forefront uh, uh, of folks' minds, um, um, especially within the responsive innovation AI teams. And so folks are aware, they're, they're thinking about it, um, but there's more work to be done. Thank you so much. I, I just think there's a lot of richness in the nonverbal visual, especially as you mentioned earlier, the gestures, uh, hand signals, and what have you that you had in your in your deck. Thank you. 100 percent Thank you, Professor. Commissioner Mayles, is there another? Commissioner Brutus and then Commissioner, Commissioner Schleiner. Brutus, if you'd be so kind. Schleiser. Yes. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you for your presentation, Dr. Patton. Uh, I am be drawn by all of what we just saw, and um, I'm amazed at the complexity and level of detail in your study and your research. And uh, so, my question um, I, I want to point at um, the 
affiliation and partnership that you have with New York City. Um, we have over, I think, over 130 municipalities in the county. And I, and I, from a regional standpoint, you know, while most of the behavioral uh, points that we are studying amongst the young Black population probably generically are similar, um, you know, the, the, each region might have a different uh, gang communication method or what have you. And so uh, I'm interested in the costs. Um, like if we were to replicate this model in each of the cities or the you know the municipalities in the county, like how much would it cost for you to be in every city, right? Because I think it would be safe to assume that every um, um, you know the communication methods are different, you know, maybe as you go regionally. Um, and maybe not all the terminologies are the same or mean the same. So, you know, a, a more focused uh or you know, potentially a more focused uh, examination regionally would also be beneficial for us, you know, for, for those you know in the face of uh, preventing violence, et cetera. So that's kind of the question. Sure, I, I think I heard that the question is related to the cost of our New York City Mayor's Office grant to study well-being um, in the city using AI and qualitative methods. It's a great question. Uh, so that particular study was a about a year and a half, two years study. And it cost a little over a half a million dollars to run that study. Those costs were associated with a number of activities. Number one, it is critically important for us to pay our participants and to pay them well for their time and their engagement in this study. And so that was one important cost. Uh, we also need, I think probably the highest cost was paying for um, engineering and student-based help help for the data science component. So that's going to be your highest cost. And so we um, hired um, a data scientist and then also hired computer science PhD students. And so, uh, you know, a data scientist is quite expensive and we paid for the time of a PhD student, which meant we had to pay for a portion of their education as well as uh, their time on the project. Uh, we also paid for any other research assistance um, time um, and for the transcription of interview-based data and for graduate students um, in social work and other social science programs that would analyze the qualitative data as well. And we then paid for any principal investigator's time. So my time and then my two colleagues um, who were uh, computer science folks um, as well. And so um, that, you know, it was probably a little, probably like 550 uh, was our was our number. And, and also to make this follow up, are you finding that there are variances, um, you know, between the regions that you guys are looking at this, for example, here in New York City, but like, is it different upstate? Or in generally speaking, are the young people or this target audience, are they kind of all speaking the same language and the vernacular that you are finding on social media is relatively easy uh, trans, um, on Yes. Yes and no. I think um, the, the thing about social media and the translation of knowledge is that we have some shared knowledge because we are hyper-connected um, hyper now. However, uh, language is also hyperlocal. So language isn't changing, I think, as fast as people think that it's changing. It has evolved over time. Uh, but young people are very much connected to what, what language is changing. I think the critical difference is the hyperlocal event-based information understanding, right? So understanding jargon and terms that are local to your neighborhood. So that's why having local domain expertise is a critical element to the work. And so we would have to have New York-based youth um, working on this project, Chicago-based youth working in Chicago and vice versa. I've done similar presentations like this in the UK. And I would say that those young people understood about 75% of the context uh, because of the translation of music. They, they listened to Chicago drill music. And so it wasn't unfamiliar to them to hear terms that Chicago people were saying, <laughs> but then when we got to the nitty gritty, got to nuances, then things got a little more challenging. Thank you very much. How are you back?
Yeah. Please. Thank you. So first of all, I want to thank you. Oh, actually, um, before I go out, I think Commissioner um, Slizer uh, has his hand up. Uh, yes. Uh, thank you. I, I, you, you partially um, answered my my question around the evolution of language and and how quickly it does evolve and how AI would react to that evolution without without ground truthing again. Um, so it it seems like for a temporal period, we're not worried about that. But you know, over maybe a year or two, intent could change. New jargon and and comes up every day. I was Absolutely. wondering how that gets incorporated. We have to refresh our systems, and so we have to have periodic checks probably every three to six months to refresh, uh, to do a number of things to refresh uh, what's in our database to extract posts or users that are no longer active, right? So we take people out that are no longer, you know, um, on Twitter or on a particular social media post, uh, but also needing to do our own training, right? And so we have to um, stay current in our understanding and also work very closely with linguists um, in this space as well to kind of keep uh, keep abreast of new nuances. Um, but honestly, the best Folks who understand those changes are young people, right? Because a lot of it is based on the culture and how the culture is shifting, how music is shifting, how technology affects how we speak and use abbreviations um, as well. And so you can have the most sophisticated linguists in the room and that young person is probably going to have a better understanding of new shifts in language than the linguist. Thank you. Um, so I had, um, again, thank you so much for your presentation. Um, I think um, it is very, um, so something that we need to make sure that we're taking into consideration as uh, I know we've spoken a lot um, um, in this commission about artificial intelligence and we've had multiple um, issues. I think but I always come with the with the legislative lens um, given the fact that, you know, that's my, that's my role um, here in Cook County. Um, uh, as a as a commission uh, commissioner of the board, um, and I think um, something that is a recurring um, conversation that we're having is in regards to um, the actual translation of either the nonverbal or the the written um, versus the interpretation. And I think that that's at the end of it where we where we're getting at, right? I, I think um, that difference. Is something that um, uh, I've been making sure that that we advocate for uh, in regards to just language access um, and ensuring that we continue to say interpretation means everything. You can translate a tweet into you know the, the what you got in your first attempt without the context. Uh, context. Um, and I think in government, a lot of the times we want easy solutions. Um, and we see artificial intelligence as something that will help solve all problems and help us um, get to where we're, we need to be and um, get us into a place where technology um, is helping us out. Um, but that has continued to be an issue. And I think um, my question uh, to you is, how do government entities ensure that interpretation is at the forefront of any investment that we do in technology, especially when it has to do with the criminal justice system. Um, I was um, the chief sponsor in 2019 to um, dismantling a, a database that was being used to criminalize Black communities and Latino communities. Um, and that is always something that is I'm very skeptical about. Um, but we want we we have to be at the tables in government, and we have to have these conversations. Um, how do we ensure that that's a priority um, as we move forward um, in, into these uh, technological advances? I think you first should establish an ethical framework and set of guidelines and principles uh, that guide your decision making with how you. Um, think about interpretation, the, the extent to which you accept interpretation uh, within uh, testimony and within your policy and decision-making as well. I think building a resource guide of folks you can consult with, um, there's a lot of research in this space, uh, folks that are doing amazing work in this area. So you would have that as a way of um, validating some of the things that may be coming through as well. I think most importantly, you need to have your non-negotiables. And I think that 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 you develop those non-negotiables by um, by 
considering uh, some of the most, most more challenging examples. We have uh, lots of examples around AI's deployment, especially within facial recognition in Black and Latino communities, and really interrogating those examples and using that to fuel and to inform what your non-negotiables are within this space, and then have those non-negotiables to then guide a set of principles uh, that you want to have. And I think you know, um, leaning and leaning into the 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 AI Bill of Rights that came out of the way that came out of the White House a couple uh, a couple of months ago can be a great starting point. Thank you. Um, the last thing I just, I, I think is a really good takeaway. I, I like the concept that you've highlighted regarding digital neighborhoods. I think a lot of the times we we paint social media as like this quote unquote fake place where it's people are presenting maybe their best, um, you know, uh, persona um, or interpretation of their life. Um, but I think um, it's very important also to highlight that um, there's it is also a place where people are the realist in a lot of um, uh, instances. Um, and I think um, really um, identifying and putting it in that perspective that it's a digital neighborhood really brings forth um, the, the need and the urgency to ensure that that uh, we're also you know holding the social media um, um, spaces accountable. Um, but also balancing what you've stated about ensuring that we're not using it um, just to to harm communities or to overgeneralize. So I, I appreciate you bringing that concept forward. And I'll yield to my uh, vice Thank chair. you. Is, are, are any other questions from the commissioners? I have a few of my own if, uh, if I'm the last one speaking here. Um, again, uh, Professor Patton, thank you for an extraordinary presentation. I, I think I have three questions. Um, the first is um, a very fundamental one, and that is uh, you had cautioned against using the strategy to predict violence, uh, but it clearly is intended to identify aggression or loss. And my question is, isn't uh, identifying aggression or loss a proxy for predicting violence? Yeah, I, 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 I use my story as a cautionary tale. I use it as a story of we made a mistake and it did not help. I think what we learned from that mistake is that young people were more likely to talk about grief and loss and complex trauma that is really helpful to understand. And we also found that within a two day window that expressions of grief and loss would translate into aggression because it would be left on platforms and left up to the devices of folks who may not have your best interest at heart and through disrespect and other means of bullying and taunting will become aggressive over time as you start to interact, right? And so, yes, our goal initially was to predict violence. And we saw that that was the wrong thing to do. What AI allowed us to do, if we engage in more reflexive practice, is to consider and, and anticipate those problematic assumptions, to anticipate those challenges of how it's applied in society and to do an about face and to redirect and to ask better questions. And I think that that's hopefully what we're up to right now. Okay, so I'm assuming what I should infer from that, that in your view, aggression or loss is one of potentially multiple factors that will lead to violence. I think understanding aggression and loss can help us understand root causes of violence. Sure I, think we, I think we constantly need to get a better grip on what's causing violence. Okay, thank you. That's helpful. I appreciate that. My, my, my second question has to do with your um, arguing in favor of a platform, a community-based platform, uh, to um, scrutinize in real time social media updates. And you talked about New York and I think Philadelphia might've been another example. Um, two parts here. One, um, what, what lessons might we learn from the way those programs were initiated and managed and how effective they were? I mean, how, how might we think about those as models for us to, uh, for us to follow or learn from? And then second, given whatever the response to that question is, where would you see us as a county, and a very large county, starting in this process? I mean, if we were to initiate, for example, 
a, a pilot project or a demonstration project, what in your view might that look like and what would it yield in your view? Great question. So first, uh, we have never deployed any platform because of the ethical dilemma that we understood by engaging in more reflexive practice. I think my journey has been one of, 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 of making mistakes and learning from mistakes. I wanna underscore that completely because artificial intelligence is, <laughs> it is, it is the rave. We get so excited about this um, deployment. And I think I got caught up in that and um, came to some realizations by, by um, being willing to um, put my bias on the table um, by putting myself in community with other scholars of color that were doing uh, critical work in race and technology that was helpful for me to uncover some of my own challenges. Um, and so we, we've never deployed it because there aren't strong enough ethical frameworks and guidelines and principles that can help people who might want to use our tool in a different context that we have no control over. So that is my biggest concern. We can create the most ethical, thoughtful tool in the world and some law enforcement agency or department or some other actor could use it and use it however they want to use it if, we don't have some type of regulation practice in place. So that's why we haven't gone there. That is our, our hope has been to support those organizations. What we've, what we've netted out is maybe AI isn't always the best option. There are low tech ways in which we can help people to ask better questions of social media. So can we help an interventionist, an outreach worker, an interrupter asks better questions of social media that may not have been a part of your repertoire before. And that has proven, we don't have evidence that it's successful, but I'm seeing it more and more and folks are becoming more literate and more versatile in their conversations around social media that I think is a really critical step. What I think is most important and where I think people should be spending their energy is in education. We have droves and droves of young people that are digital natives, they have no understanding of what it means to be a digital citizen, right? They have more understanding around the practice of social media, right? The features and characteristics of social media, how to use social media, but don't understand what it means to be a user of that neighborhood, a user of that world. When you're in seventh, eighth grade, you take classes around what it means to be a citizen of the United States, but we have not understood social media as being a world in which you are a citizen of. And so there's so, so much happening and happening so fast that we cannot catch up. The young people can't catch up, the practitioners can't catch up, the adults can't catch up. Um, and there's a need to really invest in training for those folks that are on the ground because they get what's happening, but it's too much. Social media is all encompassing, overwhelming, robust amount of data. What can we do? What can be the smallest level of training? It can't just be a one hour training that you offer once a year. What can be an ongoing practice, right? That we can work in this space. And I think one of the solutions is to think about this as a workforce development strategy. Those domain experts could now get a job at Spotify as a data curator. So that's exactly what they're doing. And that person could then leave leave Woodlawn, go through a training on data curation through my research lab, through other labs that are across the country. It could easily get a job as a data curator because they've been doing that work, right? So I think that there's an opportunity to think about how do we translate lived experience, young people who are interested in chill music and hip hop and other forms of music can use that as a tool for getting into technology jobs and opportunities. You can use that lived experience as expertise for that. So I think we need to build, we need to have digital literacy as a universal principle. We need to have more trainings for folks who are, have boots on the ground. And we need to consider the workforce development opportunities that are embedded in using technology for transformation for transformational justice. And I would argue also just if I could interrupt for a second, Mark, the digital proficiency which you said literacy but i think you know i prefer to look at it at the proficiency level of some of these individuals 
who you basically put in front of us and the, what I know goes on is way above where I'm at. Um, and they are part of the tech education, tech talent that is sitting all around us in our county, untapped for those careers. And I'm not talking about jobs, untapped for the very tech jobs you're talking about, Professor. I agree with you. It's workforce development. In, and we do have an organization I work with called the Discovery Partners Institute, which is part of the University of Illinois system that's tapping into the neighborhoods and taking talent that can do that kind of <laughs> sophisticated uh, communication with each other and use it to uh, code and do things without having to go to um, a four-year college. So I, I'm sorry, Mark, I just had a and I just, I just want to, I just want to add to that quickly. I think coding is a, is an important element, but it's not just coding. It's also product development. It's AI ethics. It's advocacy and technology. There are lots of roles. The arts, some like the control. arts, exactly. So I think that there's a lot of, of opportunities in technology. Yep. One hundred percent. Okay, so let me uh, let me take another run at this. Um, uh, you, you had indicated that this work is not to be done alone. So let me uh, interpret that, however you intended it, as an offer. Uh, how would you, uh, how, how would you um, see yourself as adding value to the commission's work, given the commission's uh, mandate to incubate actionable social policy recommendations for the county and to serve as a convener, a collaborator, a catalyst? Is it around workforce development? Is it around, um, well, I'll, I'll leave it to you. And I, I miss the, 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 the um, assumption underlying the question is that you might be willing to help us in our work and I'm only saying that because in our earlier conversation, I asked you that very question and you enthusiastically responded in the affirmative. So I'll, I'll assume that hasn't changed in the interim. Uh, but again, coming back to my earlier question, you know, where might we start? And I'll leave this open as to which specific area you think we might add greatest value. That is what is likely to be most efficacious from a public policy point of view. So I think there's a lot of answers to that. I would, you know, underscore the things I've already said in terms of digital literacy um, and the need for workforce support. Um, one of the potential collaborations, I have created a new center at Penn called the Center for Inclusive Innovation and Technology, where our goal is to disrupt who gives to be a technologist and how we bring in more inclusive, diverse and equitable thought in the development of emerging technologies. Um, and to use that as a way of training and supporting, particularly the folks of color that want to be involved in the space. So I think that doing brainstorming, uh, um, uh, designing work in that space is really helpful. Um, so I'm happy to be a thought partner and a collaborator through my center's work. Um, but I think honestly, the easiest, the lowest hanging fruit is to convene stakeholders and to have conversations about needs, opportunities, and resources, and awareness, and to use that as a foundational uh, tool, but if you will, to then think about what your next steps are. I think oftentimes we jump too quickly to solutions without understanding the problem, and so I think really getting close to our understanding of the problem definition by convening stakeholder interviews with folks that are doing workforce development, violence prevention, mental health, you know, education, all those folks need to be at the table to really get to what could come out of that and use that to then, and then bring in a designer to help design a set of opportunities uh, for that work. And my lab, we do things like that. And so if we can be of support, let me know. That would, that would be wonderful. And I think, uh... The, the very last thing you said uh, really resonates with me. A lot of the things you said resonate with me, but I'm particularly impressed by this notion of, a, of an interdisciplinary or cross-disciplinary approach where workforce development and violence prevention and other societal aims might be approached holistically and collectively. And I think that's, I think that's a really interesting and persuasive and useful approach for us to uh, consider as the commission moves forward. And I'm 
deeply grateful for your pointing that out. Thank you so much. Well, thank you so much. Are there any other questions before? I think we've we've taken almost unfair advantage of the professor's good nature here today. I say almost. Uh, any further questions? Um, if not, uh, Professor Patton, we're going to continue on with the commission meeting. You are more than welcome to stick around and uh, join us. Uh, we're, we, we very much appreciate your contributions. If you have other things to do, we understand that as well. But uh, please know that we will uh, certainly want to take you up on your generous offer to continue to collaborate with us. And uh, we are uh, we are very appreciative of everything you've done and everything you will do for us. So thanks again, and thanks for spending the time with us today. Thank you so much. Have a great evening. Thanks for the invite. Thank you so much. Thank you. Great. Um, so um, we will continue with uh, our agenda. Um, the next item on our agenda was uh, updates by the chair and vice chair. So just on my end, I'll just reiterate what we uh, what I announced at the last meeting. Um, so affidavits and the reappointments um, have been submitted for those of you that have submitted um, the signed affidavits, um, the bios, and I believe uh, your CV. Um, this is just, again, just as a reminder, procedural, given the fact that the uh, social innovation ordinance states that each term we must reappoint. So we're just going through that process right now. Um, I believe we've uh, submitted um, a handful of, of folks already that will be heard before the board meeting next week. So if you have not submitted your signed affidavit um, and the, the two other items that I've just mentioned, please reach out as soon as possible to my staff. Um, um, you can email Thalia, I know that she sent out that information. So it's extremely, uh, again, important um, so that you, again, can be official in the commission. Um, the other thing I wanna just make sure that I reiterate, I just wanna urge everyone, um, uh, because um, we are still under the governor's order, um, emergency order, we are still doing hybrid, but we will begin to do all in person. It's extremely important to have uh, all members attend in person, given the fact that we need to make sure that we're approving the minutes and that we're um, going through the the, the right um, OMA procedures. We've tried to follow those as much as possible, which is why today we were unable to approve the minutes from the last meeting. Um, and then the last thing on my end, uh, well, two other things. The, uh, the, the most important one is I will be submitting um, the annual report um, to the board. Um, I I'm going to be emailing you all a version. You have a printed one in, in front of you. If there are um, any additional areas that have not been uh, uh, captured, um, we still have um, final edits that, that are being worked on, but we needed to make sure that at least the, the general concepts that we've discussed have been captured. Um, not all of the presentations are on here. Most of them are. There have been a few that have been combi combined. For example, like the criminal justice one, um, they didn't have you know separate um, areas. Some of the same focus and the same goals and recommendations apply to both. So we have combined it to just make sure that we're condensing. Um, so just wanted to make that announcement. Um, we we hope to uh, submit. Um, at next week's uh, board meeting and have a hearing um, that will just kind of talk a little bit about the, the just summarize um, at next month's meeting. So we just wanna make sure that everything that we discussed and have worked on, that we um, capture it correctly. Yes, Commissioner Brutus, you have a question? Yeah, uh, I I wanna make sure that Tally records me as president for the yes. call and I am wondering if we didn't, if we weren't able to pass the minutes at the beginning of the meeting, I know that we'll be out of order on the agenda, but do we have a quorum now to pass the minutes? Um, so quorum needs to be met in person. Oh. So we do have a quorum by a virtual participation, but according to Oma, we're, we're unable to do so um, because we need in-person participation. And I do want to just uh, record, yes, uh, Commissioner Brutus is here, Commissioner Cooley is uh, here in person. Um, I believe the other folks that joined us virtually were Commissioner Cliento, um, uh, Bureau Chief Flores is uh, here in person, and Commissioner uh, Slizer is uh, also joining us virtually. Okay. Yeah, Commissioner Flores, yes. 
Um, am I missing anyone that I didn't call? I think I called on everyone. Okay, great. Um, and then I know um, we are still working um, on the, the presentations that we're gonna be doing in the different parts of Cook County. We're lining up a few, um, uh, given the fact that uh, some of our state legislature members um, have been in Springfield, um, they had agreed to host us and um, and also ensure, obviously, the partnership with the um, Social Enterprise Chicago um, uh, to ensure that we're doing different trainings and, and workshops throughout the county. Um, but again, because uh, folks have been in Springfield, um, it has delayed it a little bit, but we're very close to securing a few dates and we'll make sure to get the schedule out to all members. So hopefully you can join us and help amplify the reach by sharing um, to anybody that you feel that would uh, benefit from, from those. And we can provide, again, additional back, background and information as we continue to simplify those. Um, and I will turn it over to Vice Chair Lane. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Uh, let me pick up where you left off, if I may, um, just uh, to um, provide a more granular context for these uh, capacity building workshops. The intent here is to have a series of meetings where um, uh, talent from the Board of Social Enterprise Chicago uh, would present to nonprofit leaders uh, uh, opportunities that they may explore internally uh, to generate earned revenue and thereby become more financially sustainable. And it involves not only looking at the organization's core competencies and underutilized assets, but models of social enterprise uh, approaches to governance, approaches to access to capital. Um, and the uh, intent here and, and collaboration between uh, the commission and Social Affairs Chicago is to uh, flex our muscle as broadly and deeply as we can to ensure that uh, the social sector is as uh, socially impactful as possible. And the first step there is to uh, have them understand what opportunities are available to them to become increasingly self-reliant. So to the extent any of you have an interest in having such a session in your locality, these are typically going to be hosted in concert with a local policymaker. And uh, we would want to have uh, a broad turnout by the nonprofit community in that locale. We'd love to hear from you. So that's that. Uh, a second point I would want to make, since we've mentioned Social Enterprise Chicago, is uh, one week from today, uh, next Thursday, the 16th at 5 o'clock in the evening, Social Enterprise Chicago will be hosting a fireside chat where I will be sitting down and talking about social impact issues with Michael Stratmanis, who did testify before the commission. He, as you'll recall, is the executive vice president of the Obama Foundation. Uh, the event will be at Roosevelt University on Michigan Avenue. Uh, it will include not only the fireside chats, but uh, significant opportunities for um, networking and uh, collegiality. There will be an open bar if all the other stuff wasn't important enough for you. Uh, and uh, heavy appetizers still included. So if you're interested, we'd love to have you there. We'd love to have you spread the word. Uh, if you want to get the particular, shoot me an email or on my social media uh, platforms, you'll, you'll see the invitation. So we'd love to have you there. Um, the uh, final thing I wanted to mention is that uh, Professor Robert Vargas, who testified last month, uh, who, as you'll recall, is a sociologist and a data artist, and I've now learned what a data artist is, I didn't know it at the time, um, has uh, very graciously volunteered to serve as a consultant to the commission uh, with respect to any or all of the working groups where he might add value. Uh, and uh, he is initially going to be working with uh, Commissioner Austin's working group, uh, seeking to uh, look at, uh, again, violence reduction, uh, but more broadly looking at community wellness and community well-being uh, so as to uh, expand the positive externalities as violence is reduced in communities. So uh, he would be with us uh, this evening. However, he happens to be uh, overseas and he will 
likely attend future meetings and to the extent uh, any of the commissioners would like to tap into Professor Vargas's expertise as to the projects or initiatives in which you might be interested, uh, he has uh, generously made himself available for that purpose and uh, we're grateful to him. Uh, so that's the end of my updates, but I, uh, Madam Chair, would like to suggest that uh, we have uh, reports at least from a couple of our working groups. We may have more than that, but I am aware of at least two. So with your permission, let's start with those. So if I may, um, uh, Commissioner Alston, um, and thank you, by the way, for introducing Professor Patton to the commission. Uh, without your involvement, uh, we wouldn't have known about him and his important work. So thanks for that. Uh, but we would uh, love to hear uh, whatever report you might want to offer uh, from the perspective of public safety and the uh, broadening agenda and uh, wheelhouse of the work in which you and others are engaged. So Commissioner Austin, if you'd be so kind. Thank you. Th thank you very much. Uh, first, I want to just dovetail on the piece you offered up about Professor Vargas. And one of the things we are also looking at is looking at some of the uh, advanced graduate students and PhD students that are kind of under his tutorage for internship opportunities. So that there is an interest on that as well in ways that they might be working with the commission and the various working groups. And then also at the last meeting, we indicated that we presented our, our framework for the working group, uh, a values-based framework and several key initiatives we thought we would advance. One of the early ones was we've had some conversations now with the Cook County Health uh, Foundation, and we're looking at setting up a, a tour of the hospital and, and trauma center. Uh, we run up against some, uh, conflicts in terms of their scheduling, but we want to try to advance that in April or by the end of April as, as we can. And those that are interested in participating, we're certainly welcome to have you join us and look for ways that we can use that as a entree to creating some pilot projects around um, violence reduction, public health, and uh, well-being. So that's the two points that I would bring forward today. Very much appreciate that. And I, I think the uh, uh, initiative that you are uh, spearheading, Harry, is extraordinarily important because the idea here is to find ways in which the trauma center uh, might uh, serve as a demonstration site to provide wraparound services to be identified for victims of violent crime that come into the hospital along with families or others, so that when they get back out into the community, uh, they become emissaries of public health and advocacy of best practices in terms of interacting with um, forces that may not always be for good. And uh, the hospital, I think, could, if this plays out as I hope it will, and I candidly expect it will, uh, would serve as a model that might be scaled up and rolled out throughout hospitals uh, all over the county. So I think this could be a really important initiative. Uh, the University of Chicago is doing something similar already. And though uh, I spoke with the head of their trauma center this morning, and uh, they too will be engaged in this effort for us. And they actually have some empirical data to support how what they've been doing with wraparound services has positively impacted uh, their experiences beyond just uh, medical relief and remediation, but actually looking at um, community health and well being and uh, taking advantage of the opportunity when you have a gunshot victim, for example, within your four walls, and he or she then leaves those four walls. Uh, what, what message do you want them to convey and how well positioned will they be to convey that message? Um, so they become a force for good if we do it right. So I think it's a really important piece of the puzzle here. So thanks, thanks to Harry. Um, and then the other, uh, one other uh, working group that I know we'll have 
uh, reports is what we are continuing to call the industrial policy working group, although it seems to have uh, taken on also a, a broader mission. And uh, uh, Commissioner Cooley, I believe that uh, you have uh, graciously volunteered to pre present a report on behalf of that working group. And if, if you'd be so kind, we'd appreciate that. Sure. Um, thanks for having us today. Um, so the, we are also looking at the name of community-owned assets to be a little more literal in what we're intending from the work. Um, so still focusing on crafting a, a more precise definition of the goals and outcomes from the group and what we'll be attend, uh, intending to achieve from the public aims. We're really still looking at public ownership of assets within communities um, where it's usually a privately provided good or service, such as grocery stores, banking, child care, um, pharmacies, and really looking at what would it look like for the county to make investments and own, own, having that ownership and then either privately managing um, or working collaboratively with community partners to do that. Um, actual implementation of the project. We're really seeing this as an opportunity um, if the county is engaged in the ownership of the physical structure and maintaining the long-term um, asset that is required for full community health, then seeing the connections back to um, wellness, but also public safety, um, workplace, uh, workforce development. So really excited for the developments there. And so hopefully, actually we've been trying to reach out and schedule time with Commissioner Flores and Commissioner and I as well for furthering the conversation. And, and Commissioner Mayles as well. And Commissioner Mayles. Yeah. And seeing where we can sit within the structure of the county government so we can make a clear recommendation of who would be moving forward. Yes, thank you. And the idea here, of course, is to fill market gaps where services are not being made available to residents of disinvested communities and uh, have the government step in and fill that market gap uh, in areas where the county already has uh, expertise, knowledge, experience. And uh, so, um, you know, this is, a, I think, a, a very interesting idea. The county has not had an industrial policy. Here we're talking about broadening it beyond industrial to include uh, all sorts of initiatives where the county may play a catalytic role in delivering services that will lift up communities and uh, do so in a way that employs people and um, you know it contributes to the tax base and does all sorts of good things. So, uh, Roger, thank you for your hard work on this, and I think uh, you know we're going to have some conversations uh, internally and, and and see if we can bring this forward potentially as early as uh, as next month's meeting. So, so thank you for that. Great, and recommend Commissioner Thomas who's chairing the committee. Yeah, Commissioner Thomas, uh, of course, was unable to deal with us today, but she has been uh, working uh, at least equally as hard, maybe harder, and uh, we're, we're deeply grateful for her for her leadership. So, so thank you. Um, are there other working groups represented today who have a report to offer? Hearing none, let me just um, uh, give you a. A preview of coming attractions. Um, next month's meeting, uh, we, we will have testimony around a topic that uh, became the subject of working group that has not yet advanced. Uh, and it has to do with, and this has been a subject of a very um, interesting, sometimes provocative public dialogue, and that is uh, electric vehicles. Uh, we did have testimony on that last year, so I just wanted to um, plant the seed that if that is an area that you might have an interest in, and I won't go beyond that because I don't want to steal the speaker's thunder, but there will be thunder and there will be a speaker. Uh, so if any of you have an interest, I, I encourage you to uh, kind of uh, uh, think about the ways in which you might uh, be involved in a working group around that issue. And then one more uh, preview. Um, the following month, um, we will have a session as we had last December, which was widely applauded, and that is one without any witness, but where the commissioners uh, had a very open exchange of ideas, 
and it was suggested we do this periodically. Uh, so next month will be electric vehicles redux, and the month after that, uh, I'd like to see all of our commissioners present physically here, and uh, with the expectation that we will have a, uh, a, a, a very granular conversation on a number of the topics that we started with and are now moving forward, as well as some of the topics we started with that either are going to be dead in the water and we will so conclude, or that may have renewed life and find ways to resurrect them. So that's kind of uh, where we're at for the next for the next couple of months. So I hearing no further um, uh, suggestion that another working group wishes to uh, report. Madam Chair, it's back to you. Thank you. Um, and I do want to report um, back that um, there have been a lot of the different uh, bureaus and, and offices and uh, Cook County entities that have reached out. Um, so I'll be working uh, with Vice Chair Lane to figuring out how they they uh, fit in. Uh, I know many times we've talked about the the land bank. Um, a lot of our conversations, including uh, you know Commissioner Cooley's, um conversation, um, the land bank could play a role. So we want to make sure that we are um, including. Um, and not working in silos. We want to make sure that they're a part of it. And just this week, the Justice Advisory Council um, heard about our conversation at the last meeting and wants to come and introduce themselves and some of the work that they're doing. So I'm excited about that. Um, we're hoping that we can, you know, have them uh, fit in, into some of our conversations going forward. I think that's a wonderful idea. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So um, those were the only uh, uh, things on my end. Um, I know that uh, the um, the next meeting, um, again, will uh, will be still considered um, uh, partly um, um, hybrid. Uh, but after that, the May one is is um, is when the order is lifted. So we do expect all members, um, if possible, reach out to us um, uh, with ample time to ensure that um, for next month um, we had a very uh, difficult. Um, uh time uh, today getting the technology running in this room um just given again the 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 uh, we didn't have um techno bureau of technology uh supporting us today so we wanted to make sure that for those of you that are joining us virtually um to let us know well in advance so if we do need to make accommodations we can do those well in advance and don't have to um obviously have you waiting in the in the waiting room or are not being able to participate in next month's meeting. But with that uh, with that said, um, I don't have any any other business before um, the commission. So I will entertain a, mo a motion by Commissioner Brutus. Can I get a second for adjournment? Second, second by Commissioner Flores. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Thank you. Have a good one. Stay safe and be well, everybody.